will do is tell you a little bit of history about Mr. Johnston, and then we will take a walk through the house. If you have any questions as we go through, do feel free to ask, to ask them of me. Uh, also, photography is welcome, so if you want to take pictures when you're inside, don't worry about that. Only thing we ask, of course, is just to not pick up and touch items inside the house as we move through. All of the inventory of the house dates between, I would say, probably the 1790s and 1830s. So if we pick up an old chair or we sit on it, you know it's going to happen. It's going to fall apart. <laughs> so, so that's about the only rule. Upstairs, when we get downstairs, if you guys want to, I don't know how... Um, gang ho you are for ch kitchen chores, but I do have some kitchen chores in the kitchen that I will make you do, uh, but there are some things down there you can pick up and touch and do that kind of thing. So, Well, Mr. Johnston uh, was born in Ireland in 1775. He came to America when he was a young boy of 11 years old. For them, of course, they would have thought of that as a young man, not a boy. He was about one year away from being the same as about an 18-year-old nowadays. So he came uh, at, in 1786 and established himself in Pennsylvania. was there a few years, and he said all the soldiers kept coming back from the frontier, and they just got him all fired up to see the Wild West. So what he did was he came out here to the Wild West, which of course at that time was Ohio or Indiana. <laughs> And so he came out here, he saw this land passing through it as a young man driving wagons for Anthony Wayne, uh, for the army. And so he saw it, he said he determined upon the spot that it would be his. So he made his mind up he was going to live here someday. And that took him until he was about 27 years old. He was about 18 when he first saw it. So that would have been 1802 then or 1803? Eight, this would be 1793, 1795 okay. when he first saw it. And then actually purchased it in 1804. Uh, so life took him back to Pennsylvania. He ended up uh, working in Philadelphia as a clerk in the Supreme Court. And then he got his foot in the door and he ended up as one of the first two U.S. factors to the Indians. And a factor is a fancy name for a guy that ran the trading post. Basically, the United States government had never traded with the Indians, just the French and the English had. And so they thought under President Jefferson, if we started to trade with the Indians, then the French and English would leave. And we all know how that worked out, right? <laughs> so that was kind of the idea. So he was sent out to Fort Wayne in the Indian Territory to run a trading post. Traveling along with him was his lovely young bride of two weeks. Her name was Rachel Robinson. She was city born and bred from Philadelphia. Uh, their honeymoon journey was approximately a thousand miles on the back of a horse over the mountains and through the Indian Territory out to Fort Wayne. I would politely describe Fort Wayne in 1802 as a mud hole full of malaria. It was a horrible place. It flooded frequently, had lots of mosquitoes, people were always sick. They said for the complement of soldiers, which was about a hundred, a third of them would be sick, a third of them would be in jail, and a third of them would be doing their duty. That's kind of what Fort Wayne was. So they lived out there for about 10 years altogether. Uh, about six years into it, Mr. Johnson also became the Indian agent, which means that he also handled the political matters, the payments of annuities, the treaties, all those sorts of things. So he did that out there, but about halfway through it also, one of their children sickened and died. And when the little girl died, Mr. Johnson just basically starts to say, I can't stay here. I, I have to get out of here. So they went to Fort Wayne in 1802. 1804, the land came up for sale. Somehow, in an age before cell phones, he found that out. <laughs> he came here and he put money down on it. Purchased it over the next four years. Family did not move here till 1811, though, because he was committed out at Fort Wayne. So 1811 came along. Uh, they came here. They moved into a log house, first of all, which we do not have anymore. That was in July of 1811. So I'm sure Mrs. Johnson thought everything was wonderful. No more support, no more soldiers, no more malaria. Then, of course, the War of 1812 broke out. And they knew the war was coming, actually, as of March of 1812, that it was going to happen. So they knew it was coming here. Mr. Johnson probably realized that there were going to be a lot of Indians and a lot of soldiers passing through here because one of the main military routes is State 66. So all the soldiers walked up from Dayton and Cincinnati to get up north to Detroit and Dearborn and places like that. So it became an Indian agency here during the War of 1812, continued through 1829. 1828, Andrew Jackson was elected. Uh, Mr. Johnston was a Whig, and Andrew Jackson was a Democrat. So we know what happened, right? He got fired <laughs> the next year. Wrong political party. By then, the couple had all 15 of their children, one mom, 15 kids. 14 of them made it to adulthood. Unfortunately, between 1840, when his wife died, and 1849, seven of the 14 children also died. So he literally lost half his family in 10 years, had no deaths before that. Uh, two of them because of childbirth, two because of wars. Two were actually what we would call developmentally disabled, and they just did not outlast their mother by very much. And then one in a cholera epidemic. 
So at the end of that, Mr. Johnson left the house here. He moved out. He went to uh, Cincinnati to live with a couple of children, kind of briefly, and then ended up in Dayton with his daughter, Julia Patterson. So I don't know if you guys know about our Patterson connection, but all those Pattersons of Dayton are descended from John Johnston. Mm -hmm. So his daughter, Julia Johnston, married Jefferson, of Pat Jefferson Patterson, who was the youngest son of Colonel Robert Patterson. Julia's son was John Henry Patterson, who started National Cash Register, or NCR, down in Dayton. So Mr. Johnson lived at the Patterson Homestead down on Brown Street. You can still visit it also. It's part of Dayton history. Uh, for the last 10 years of his life, from age 75 to 85, but to show you what folks were made of in the 19th century, at 83 years old, he took a journey from here to visit a family friend. He just only went as far as Maine to do that on horseback and on trains. <laughs> and at 85, then he went to Washington, D.C. He was still conducting business with the government, and he actually died in Washington, D.C., one month shy of being 86. Where is he buried at? He is buried in our cemetery, which is up on the hill. Forest here. Hill? Uh, nope, not Forest Hill, the one before that. It's Johnson Cemetery. Okay. It's actually, you can see it out our window. Okay. So it's right straight across in 66. So uh, he actually died, though, in Washington, so he had to be brought back here, laid in state downtown somewhere <laughs> for a while. So after John left the house, it went to his son, John Henry, and then after John Henry, it went to William. William was a merchant in Cincinnati, so he never lived here. He just rented the house out to tenants. So people farmed the land, but owned the, he, the people that owned the house never lived in it again. The Johnsons were the only ones who owned it and lived in it. So when the tenant farmers were here, they only used the half over here, which is the older portion, the 1812 house. They lived in the dining room, the parents' room, and the rooms underneath. The rooms above, the rooms above here, this room here, no one lived in. They were used for storage, various things over about 100 years. At one point, they turned this room into a sheep pen. So there used to be sheep in here. <laughs> and when they did the reconstruction, they pulled up the floorboards, they found oats and sheep droppings underneath the floor. So that confirmed the story that it was a sheep pen. <laughs> so you can kind of imagine, they sort of pulled everything out looked at the wall, saw where the original doors were, the original staircases had been moved. So they found a hidden staircase they didn't even know existed. So because of that, they took it all the way out, put it all the way back together, and they reconstructed and restored it to what they believed the 1829 home looked like. So this is the Indian agency before anybody made any changes to the structure. As far as the furniture, it did not belong to them, but when he left in 1848, he had an auction. So what they did was they based the auction listings on what he owned. So if Mr. Johnson had a copy of the declaration, we have a copy of the declaration from 1830. So everything's dated to their time period. It pretty, pretty closely mirrors what they had in the house, and then the original pieces I'll point out as we walk through. Well, you guys got a question about anything that you wonder about? Okay. Want to know any more history? Bored already? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, well, we will take a walk through the house then, okay? <laughs> now watch your step up. <laughs> okay. I assume the old original fireplace was re well, actually. The fireplaces themselves, the fireboxes are original. Is they, that still here? They, yeah, the firebox, which is behind there. The reason for that being covered over is summertime. In yeah. the summer, they didn't use the fire, so they would cover it. The chimney is actually a straight chute. There's no way to lock it. So <coughs> you have raccoons come in your house if you left the chimney open. <laughs> so they would put the covering on it. The reason for the other hangings in here is the mm -hmm. same thing. Spring cleaning was a two to three week event. You turned the whole house over for summer, then you turned it all the way back over for autumn. So part of what they did was put hangings on things because you were gonna have your, your windows open all summer long. So birds, dust, everything comes in here. If a bird roosts on Colonel Johnson's portrait, we know what's gonna happen, right? It's gonna poop and it's gonna ruin the guilt. <laughs> so, so they would cover everything over. So if you wonder about all the hangings and things, that's what that's about in here. This is Mr. Johnson here that was painted in 1820 when he was 45 years old. And he was the Indian agent at that time. And that is actually original. That was painted in Philadelphia from life. So that's one of our pieces. Clock in the back corner belonged to Colonel Robert Patterson. And that was a gift to us from the Patterson estate to show the connection between the two households. If you wonder about my little pink-eared friend up on the clock, we actually have a scavenger hunt for kids in the house if you guys want to do it. You're the age, I'm not sure. <laughs> but if you want to look for the mouse, there's a little sheet over on the table there on the piano. You can pick that up and that'll give you clues for each room as we walk through if you want to look for the mouse. So the clue in here is it's time to look for the mouse. And that's one of my little friends up there that you can see on the clock. 
It's so that the little bitty kids know what they're looking for. That's <laughs> basically why I've done that. So drawing room, a moment ago we drew in. Uh, they did not say, let's go in there. I want to walk in there. They said, let us draw into the room. So we drew into the room, meaning it was called the drawing room. This is the first room you would come into to visit the Johnstons, uh, meet and greet, and then go wherever else you were going to go. So this is kind of the fancy form of the room. So you guys got a question about anything in here that you wonder about? Anything funny looking? Okay, if not, like I said, if you guys want a sheet, they're in the basket on the can up there. And I'm going to head on over to the drawing room. Uh, dining room. by 1812, where we stepped up, where the ramp is, that's the back of the original house. So there's a five brick thick outer wall, as well as the door. <laughs> what year was that original built? Original was built between 1810 and 1812. So that's the section we're in right now. It's three stories, uh, fireplace to fireplace. Then he became an agent in March of 1812, and in May of 1812, there's a letter that says, I need that other half built now. <laughs> so I think he realized that he needed a private house and a public house. So if you close that door, upstairs, downstairs, downstairs, no one could get into this half of the house from those two rooms. And I'll show you how that worked upstairs. So this was probably private quarters, but then opened up when they had guests that were doing parties, entertained, kind of had the table set for entertaining. Obviously, you're not going to get 15 children around there at this point. <laughs> so this is like mom, dad, a couple of friends, and the oldest kids is the way we're set up. In this room, the two silver pieces on the bottom shelf in the corner cupboard belong to their daughter Elizabeth, and that was probably part of her wedding present that she got from her dad. I always bought a silver tea set for the daughters. And then the two plates above that belong to Mrs. Johnson, and before her they belong to her grandmother, Rachel. And so those are most likely pretty much known to be over 300 years old. Wow. So they're, they're ancient. <laughs> And then the andirons of the fireplace belonged to their son, John Henry Dearborn, who took the house over after his dad left. Dishes on the table are not the Johnsons, but during the excavations, they found broken pieces of this pattern. This is original Josiah Wedgwood, and they extract about the 1700s. Well, have you guys got a question about anything in here that you wonder about? Okay, if not, well, if you want to look at any of those items, take a minute, and then you can follow me on anything. And if you could see it, because of the floor and you can't, the cemetery is straight Okay. Here. Okay. <laughs> when we don't have corn, you can see the headstones. <laughs> corn kind of blocks the bottom of the house, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> Did you find it? <laughs> okay, well, uh, unlike the modern world, this is the master bedroom, and it's one of our smallest rooms. <laughs> So it was only called the master bedroom because the master slept in it. And Mr. Johnson would have been the master of the house, head of the household, all those terms. Some of them we still use on our tax papers, don't we? Head of household. So mom and dad would have been in here. Baby would have stayed downstairs with them because, of course, at this time, mom was not using bottles. They actually did have bottles at this time, but no formula, um, no plastic nipples. <laughs> so they weren't used too often. So mom would keep the baby down with her. Mrs. Johnson had one new baby approximately every year and a half for 27 years. No twins, no triplets, all individual births. Stephen was 27 when James was born. And by that time, they had grandkids. So there were always kids in this house. These are copies of John and Rachel's wedding portraits. Uh, John was 27 when they married. Rachel was two days over 17. If you remember that lovely honeymoon journey, the fact that they were going to Fort Wayne, he was a soldier. That's his original military certificate when he became a captain in the Pennsylvania militia in the middle there, which is signed by one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, which is Thomas McKean. He was also Episcopalian or Church of Ireland, and she was Quaker. And if you know anything about Quakers, mom did not approve of an Episcopalian or a soldier. <laughs> so she told her no. 
Uh, Rachel defied her. They eloped. She snuck out in the middle of the night. They took off on that lovely honeymoon journey. And she actually was disowned for four years at that point. In 1806, they took the three grandkids. They went back to... Um, actually to christen the baby that died then in Fort Wayne the next year. And apparently they went back to see her mother and made up at that point. So she was only disowned for about four years. <laughs> well, you guys got a question about anything in here that you want her about? What's that green thing on the bed? That is a bed wrench, and that's kind of why this sits down here. This is a little demo bed, so you can see the ropes on the bottom. Uh -huh. So that's what's underneath here. Your ropes would get loose, uh, okay. and so every so often what you had to do was tighten them. Okay. And so this, Let's see if I got my peg here. This would go up here and you would pull and twist and then you would drive your peg in and then you'd move to the next one and the next one and the next one. They said it took two girls to do a bed this big. Right. A little cot you could do by yourself. At the end then you had the slack which you would tie off and then your back wouldn't hurt because your ropes were tight. Right. So supposedly the reason we say sleep tight comes from this because you have to tighten your ropes every so often. Wow. Don't let the bed bugs bite came from the fact that if you're going to stuff your mattress with straw that's been in the barn, guess what? You're going to have bed, bugs in it. <laughs> so, so I think it was sleep tight, don't let the bugs in the bed bite. I don't think they were talking about bed bugs. If you guys want to feel that free to, feel free to, that is your straw mattress. <laughs> now, if you feel the mushy part on the bottom, it's kind of softer. So after you slept on it for a while, it didn't poke as much, but <laughs> but it did poke in the beginning. <laughs> but have you got a question about anything else in here that you wonder about? What are these paintings on the wall? What's uh, they are, this and I think is Captain Cook, they are adventurers, kind of from the time before the Johnstons. Then the two in the drawing room are actually of China. And their son Stephen, as a late naval lieutenant, actually traveled to China. So he had been there, and I think they probably were like postcards he sent home to mom and dad. That's why I say when they matched the Johnson's inventory, they matched it down to engravings of China. I mean, if you're going to bother to do that, that's you know shows you it's a pretty close match for what's in here. Okay, well we will head up the stairs next. <laughs> We're going to take a picture. <laughs> Oh, we were already in that. Forgot a ball of milk. <clears throat> This is where multiple kids slip. That's what the whole upstairs is. There's multiple kids. <laughs> like I said, if you think about the fact that they already had grandkids here before their last boy was born, there were always a lot of kids in this house. <laughs> we are again also in what I call the public portion of the house or the second house, the addition. So this was open to the public. So to have your boys here uh, was no big deal. Boys were considered adult at 12. So about like an 18 year old at 12, and then about like a 22 year old at maybe 16, 17. People died a lot younger, so they grew up a lot faster. Uh, Robinson Johnson was at Miami Oxford University at 12, and he was in West Point Military Academy at 15. So yeah, he grew up fast. <laughs> and he only lived to be 31, and another brother lived to be 31, and the two brothers lived to be 45. 45 was a life expectancy for a man at that time. So. Mr. Johnson made it to 86, <laughs> and Mr. Johnson's mom made it to 89. So women's life expectancy was 30 to 35 years at this time. So grandma was ancient <laughs> by their scale, their scale. So up on the male piece and repeated here on the wall, those are images of three of the boys. Uh, the oldest one, Stephen, we don't have. Uh, Robinson is the guy in the funny hat. We think that's either an artist smock and cap because that's actually, we think, a self-portrait he did of himself while he was at the West Point when they took art classes. Or it could be a dress covering for his uh, dress uniform to keep the uniform protected until he went on parade. 
He looks like a medieval reenactor, but he's not. So <laughs> that's Robinson. John Henry was the middle one. We don't have a picture of him. He was the farmer who remained here in Piqua and took over the farm. And then William and James were both merchants in Cincinnati. Uh, James, unfortunately, went off to fight in the Civil War and died of typhoid in 1862 during the war. So Robinson was killed in battle. Uh, Stephen died of an illness picked up while he was sailing the world. So all three of them that were military died as a result of their service. And then over here in the case, these are all items that belong to the Johnsons with the exception of the little penmanship book in the corner. That's just to show you what the writing was like. But all the rest of those did belong to them. You want to look at those. We got a question about anything in here? It looks as though this is like a bowling. It is. It's, it's nine pins only. We only have eight. But it is nine pins. Don't what fear. Was, it's You're a funny fine. Story. Don't worry. Bowling, nine pins was really popular. Wow. And people had way too much fun. They got way too rowdy while they were playing it. Wow. And so it actually got out. There were new bowling existed it was, that back then. It was too then. rowdy and too much fun. So then some years later, somebody added another pin, turned it into ten pins and it became the bowling that we know now. So the moral of that story is people will get around everything somehow. <laughs> Were these considered toy guns back in those? That, those are dummy guns. Yeah. Toy those guns back in those days? Yeah. No question? Is this a seven-person room? This would probably be a 20-person room, actually. This is probably, what, close to 300 20. square feet, mm -hmm. probably it's, this it's room. Big. Well, if you, if you read about their log cabin, their log house that they had, yeah. it said it was not uncommon to have 20 to 30 soldiers sleeping on their floor. The log house was about this size. So, yeah. And I assume the floors are original and everything. The floors actually had to be replaced. They are replicated. They're made from 200-year-old trees. and. What kind of wood fashion. were they out of? These are oak. They believe These the are originals oak. were cherry. And the cherry did not hold up. They found broken pieces of it. Well, if you're having trouble with money, which they did in the 1830s, oh, and yeah. you've got a house full of cherry, you're probably going to sell it. You're not going to leave it under the other floor. So they had to replicate these. But they are as close as you can possibly get. And they're getting they're almost antique themselves. They're, I think they're almost 50 years old now. So they're going to be their own antique eventually. Okay, well, we will head over to the next.